Ja, hello everyone. Mid during the mid time or during the day, uh, great to see everyone. Um, now we come to a topic which should and is dear to the hearts of entrepreneurs, of journalists, of citizens who care about music, theater, um, the arts, and science. Freedom of the press and freedom of speech. It's a foundation of all other freedoms. When you look at repressive systems, the first thing which gets normally out of the way is journalists, is publishers, is people writing about what's going on. And after that, all other freedoms go. Music, theater, painting, art, science. And we talk about this topic today, and uh, we saw many maps during the last days. We saw the maps for how the world is organized in micro countries, and how you look at the world in this case, you can see maps for the fight for food, maps for the fight for water, even the fight for sand, sand for buildings is a big point. But there's also another map, the world map of reporters without borders. And I just cl will click through it in 10 seconds. Just think, the darker it gets, the less freedom for all the freedoms we know and we have on this planet as possible. Right? And see here the, the positive green. I mean, if Greenland would not be on that map and there's not many people there, it would be very small, right? So this is where you have freedom. Probably most of you come from countries where you can sing, dance, perform, paint, talk, write, publish. Um, but there's, and just keep in mind, we have almost 8 billion people on the planet. And when it gets darker, you see um, these are countries, regarding your reporters without borders, where you can, you know, there are some limitations. Most of it is regulation, state or local regulation. Um, but now we're getting into parts where it gets darker and where you have not only regulation, where, it's, where you need to be more careful what you publish, what you say, what you sing. Um, and We're going to talk about a country now where Yevgeny is from, about Russia, from Russia. And when you look how dark this map is now, and we will end with a positive thought, I think, at the end of it. Because when I look at this, and I can live here in Germany, I represent 350 companies publishing content for business, for private, for fun, for the arts. Um, I'm really glad, and you got your proper uh, introduction already to uh, we spoke during the last couple of days and Yevgeny is a programmer a musician and someone a developer someone who cares and um, maybe we start with the name of Zamisdat because sure. it shows basically how important it is what what you are doing what is Zamisdat in the when you talk from the olden days when there was no internet when there was no computers or, or like computers big as rooms so the word sum is dot literally translates into self-publication and it was just a system, uh, an agreed upon system that helped the, pub the public in Soviet Russia smuggle content into the country. It was all sorts of content, it wasn't just the press, it was music, it was literature, everything was banned. And people would unite to smuggle the content in and then there was a system where each person would commit to making their own copies of it and they would keep one copy and they would make two more copies by hand and then distribute those on and on and on. And uh, this was the only way through which the Soviet public was able to truly understand what was happening outside their borders. Um, they were inundated in propaganda and the people who did not participate in Samizdat were entirely oblivious to what the real world looked like. And um, my father, who took me out of this country when I was seven years old, and I'm eternally grateful to him. Uh, he uh, learned yoga through Samizdat, which he used to cure himself of tuberculosis, or so he says. But the point is, without Samizdat, he would not have learned yoga, which is, for most people here, a pretty common and innocuous subject, which they believe they can 
you know, walk into any studio on the street and start doing it. That wasn't the case there. So <clears throat> that's the underlying ethos. And um, here we are in 2022, and Russia under Vladimir Putin, and he's just one autocrat, right? We're, we're, we'll, we'll talk about the others, but he is a master of propaganda. Uh, it's really seemingly the only thing he's a master of. Everything else he seems to suck at pretty badly. But, but the propaganda is so fabulously crafted. It's so clean. It is so polished. It is nothing like what people uh, who aren't familiar with it imagine it to be. Um, most people think that it's just some general covered in medals standing in front of a camera and yelling about NATO being bad and Putin being bad, uh, Biden being bad. Um, but that's not what it looks like. It's, it's incredibly well produced. It's mostly entertainment. It's mostly not news. Um, and the messaging is very, very sharp. And the people in this region are fundamentally m confused about what is happening in the world. And it is because of this confusion that they were so easily <sighs> convinced that um, their brothers and sisters in Ukraine are somehow magically Nazis who have elected themselves a Jewish president. And now it's time to go and save these Jew-loving Nazis from themselves or something. But this story somehow resonated yeah. with, with, the, with the public. So Evgeny, when we, when we look at, at the map, it's, and when we think back to what Zamis that was, that was an analog system to get information out. And people were really, I mean, it was scary, yeah? I mean, to, to have a printed copy somewhere, bring it to someone else, distribute it, and get the word out. And there's, there's research being done that Zamistad in the olden days helped to change and, f and feed the, the way uh, to the change which happened under Gorbachev in Russia. So in, information was truly important. And so what brought you in as a developer? I mean, you're a developer, you're smart, you're a musician, you could have launched a service for an e-commerce service and, and spend all your time and energy, why the freedom part? Because music is so, you can sing not all the songs you want in a dictatorship often. Or girls cannot sing everything what they want in some parts of the world. So what is your driver? Well, Before the, we go into the technical part, because DLD is about bringing things together, yeah. right? So the original impetus uh, was uh, kind of a just a light bulb that went off. I, I run and own a small software development company that just does software for, for clients. It's nothing, nothing interesting or anything to come to DLD with. Um, and I hire engineers in Russia and Ukraine. I have about 25 people who work for me there. Um, and uh, up until February 24th, if you had asked me where are these people, I would say, I don't know. I talk to them every day on, uh, you know, on, on uh, video conference, but um, I've never really, I don't, I don't really care where they are. They, they're, they're wonderful engineers, they're wonderful people, but it never occurs to me to ask. On February 24th, that changed drastically, and it turned out about half of them were in Ukraine and half were in Russia, and I had to scramble to figure out how to help them in obviously very different ways, the guys that were in Russia, who ultimately started helping me to write what we will talk about in a moment. Um, I had to try to pull them out into Turkey, into Georgia, um, and then, of course, the guys in Ukraine, it was a much more precarious situation. I offered a couple of them to take their families into Canada, where I reside. Uh, I won't tell you exactly where. Um, that was a joke. Um, and thank you. <laughs> and, uh, but that was all sorted out, right? It was, that was logistics, and everything was settled to the extent to which I could help them, I did. And I just felt this uh, very strong urge to do something more. Um, and just by serendipity, because I had started my technological career, after I'd ended my music and comedy career and went into technology, I was at CBS News for several years. And so I developed various journalistic connections at CBS News, which I retained throughout my professional life. Um, and so I reached uh, out to those people and I said, if I built something that, was, um, that would facilitate the distribution of all content back into Russia and then subsequently into Belarus, and why, uh, while we're at it, why not Iran and China and everywhere else? Um, and everybody said, how could you do that? And I was like, oh, it's actually pretty easy because the internet is built in a certain way and it's been that way for decades. It hasn't evolved. It can't evolve for complicated reasons. Um, well, it can't evolve because everything would have to evolve all at once for everything to work, and it just won't. 
So, I had this idea and everybody said, yeah, that's a great idea, you should do it. And so I did it. Yeah, so the question is, am I Zamestad analog was powerful, but also dangerous for people distributing. And it, as you said, they it was not even possible to get information about yoga because it was not part of the system, the idea. It was not possible to get, you know, notes for, for the piano for some songs. You, so, and this, and what you are doing now, and I, for me, I, I call it, it's basically semi-start on steroids. How do you use technology to get information which in the most easiest way, not via complex C VPN systems, not via complex technology. How do you find a way to do it so that you get free independent information, free independent journalism, free independent information uh, in and out of countries which are under pressure, where people want to share, where it's really dangerous. So you being, you being a developer, so what did you do? What is your, what is your idea and how do you how do you make sure that that you can turn analog semistat into digital so the first thing i did actually is i approached my co-founder michael sprague who's a age-old friend and colleague and he's uh, he's a bit of a genius um uh, in in the true sense of the word and i asked him how he thought about this and he was like oh absolutely i'm in and i actually have a whole bunch of code that's kind of sitting on the shelf that we can just reuse for this. So as a result, we had a really, really short development cycle. We were up and running within roughly two to three weeks after this idea came to my mind. Um, and then, of course, I brought my engineers online and we have been developing it. Obviously, it's really rough around the edges still. We're a very tiny shop. But um, if, if the question is, how does it work and what is, it, what is the mechanism, what is the idea? The idea is that it's, we are an aggregator. We ask publishers to come and join our umbrella. We have, at the moment, about 50 publishers, mostly in Belarus and Russia um, and Ukraine. And uh, we distribute eventually hundreds and hundreds. At the moment, it's not, not quite as, um, as uh, horizontally elaborate as it needs to be, but that's just a scaling problem. Um, we have these node servers that proxy the content that is I don't know if the word proxy is something that people will say. What does that mean? It means we go and fetch the content, and then we change all the links inside that content so it's once again more of these SOS links that we call them. And these links can't be stopped because they are complete, like they're gibberish. They're, they're, they're garbage links that happen to point to whatever the end content is. But you can take one of these SOS links and you can send it to your uncle in Novosibirsk or your mother in Moscow or your Anyway. You send it via WhatsApp, email, you send, whatever. You just, yeah, you email it, you Telegram, WhatsApp it. You just, all the channels. In, in, any, in any way that you would normally send a link. You send the link and they click on it and they see it. Um, and that's the pivotal difference between um, VPN usage. Because VPN usage is a very proactive um, technology. You need to, need to want to use VPN. You need to know that you're looking for something. That is the QR code to our website. If you scan it, you can exper experiment with this for yourself. You will see what we do is we... Um, <clears throat> my uh, team of amazing journalists, we scour the publications that we're unblocking for the most interesting stories, and then we translate their headlines into English, Russian, Belarusian, Ukrainian, and Farsi. Um, all the stories get translated into those five languages. We don't pick and choose. Um, and that way, you can choose the language you want. You can find a story you find interesting. You grab a link, send it on, and... It, it, it gets to where it's going and people could read that information. So, Yevgeny, in times of especially war, because I, had, uh, I spoke to a Ukrainian journalist uh, a couple of weeks ago, and she told me that they broadcast on the web and also on television, and they get attacked frequently with cyber attacks, which is, I mean, they, they say when we go out in the field as a journalist with my badge embedded in the Ukrainian army, I'm a target. They lost already five colleagues. So, so you're more like on the development end, you program. Do you fear when you go really public, when you push out your servers, when you have, now you have, you told me five servers, when you have 40 servers, basically he needs also funding for that. Um, is there, how high is the risk that, that your system can be broken and attacked? Because this is another issue all publishers face at the moment. 
Well, technologically, the risk is reasonably low, and we are very seasoned technologists, and we anticipate the different ways that can we, be, we can be attacked. Also, we have been very fortunate to get some help from uh, Radio Free Europe, who have been working with this problem for ma many, many years. Um, so we know what to anticipate, and uh, certainly the Russian Ruskom Nadzor, which is what they're called, the, their, their tech uh, terrorism, they are sophisticated, but the Iranians are even more sophisticated, and the Chinese, they, they're at the top of that mountain. Um, so we definitely have our work cut out for us to stay ahead of all of the potential damage that we're going to incur, but, um, but I'm confident that uh, we will be able to persevere. So what do, you, what do you need at the moment in terms of if you want to grow? Because if you spread and it works and people try to spread the links, get to your content, consume the content, yeah. what, is, what is that what you work? Because you have the code, you have the developers, what, is, what do you need for scale? Yes, yeah, so, so we're because very... You're, talking not, you're not only talking Russia, right? You're talking maybe right. Iran, you're talking... Belarus. Belarus. Right now, and Iran, yeah. Um, so we, we, we're very close to becoming the victims of our own success because we've established relationships with TV Rain, Dorst, and um, Medusa, and Echoes of Moscow, and Ukrainian Pravda, and as I said, roughly 50 publications which have tremendous uh, viewership and readership. Um, and we're waiting for just a split second to pull the trigger on having them all announce to the world, hey, come use this because uh, we're nervous that uh, we will not be able to withstand the barrage of, of uh, traffic that we will have to uh, carry through our servers. So uh, what we're hoping for is that in the midst of the next few weeks, uh, some um, magical fairy will come along and throw some money at us, uh, and then we will be able to scale horizontally as we need to in order to be ready for that kind of traffic. But it's a great problem to have, right? Because there's yeah. roughly, right out of the gate, there's roughly 100 million people who will immediately be using our service. So uh, that, that, um, I'm, not, I'm not overly concerned about the, the success of this thing. I'm just, I'm just concerned about making sure that we have the capacity to, to service everybody as necessary. Yeah, I think, I think when, we, when, we, when we look at what, what you are doing and where you, you put your, in your energy, um, we all need freedom for the jobs we have for the work we do, for the traveling, for the creativity, for the writing, for the musicians. And so I really appreciate that uh, uh, Steffi and her team put this topic at the end of the session. I know it's all recorded, so you can distribute it also. Yeah, uh, we will. And yes, I, I feel we, we were the main act for quite a while. They, they brought in something else, but we were, we were yeah. like, we were, we were Metallica for, for, for a couple of days, but now we've been demoted to maybe Anthrax. I don't know. Again, that's another joke. Um, I, <laughs> yes, the, we, we, um, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful that this was uh, made possible. Actually, my, my, my co-founder, Michael's father, Peter Sprague, he's a stalwart member of the DLD, and it's he who organized this uh, and made it possible for me to come and uh, sing my song in front of you lovely people. Excellent. And you go to Davos now and hopefully yeah, and meet next, some more next people. Yeah, next time on to Davos. To to connect connect and I, there's some rabble going there, and I'm going to try to try, try to find them and see, see what they think about all this. Okay. And so you, you musician, doing an awesome job, and he's doing everything that your colleagues in Russia and elsewhere also can play what they want. I, I was tempted to ask if I could play myself out, but I'm going to let you guys handle it. All right. All right, thank you for your attention. Thank you for spending the time with us and with the topic and carry it uh, forward you. Thank you.